Fishing like a local isn't just about catching fish. It's about connecting with the environment and the people who call it home. It's about hearing the stories and traditions that have been passed down for generations and sharing unforgettable moments with the people you meet along the way. Fishing like a local is having an experience that stays with you forever. And with Fishing Booker, you can experience it too, no matter where you are. Discover your next adventure on Fishing Booker. All right, guys, welcome back to episode 230. We have made it to a milestone. Oh, that's not really actually a milestone, but it's it's something special, I guess. Wouldn't you say, Steve, 230? That's that's good. 230, it's a good number. That is a really good number. Was that the year that you were born? No, I don't think so. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure. Okay, all right. Well, this is episode 230. This is your boy, East Coast Trev, and I'm joined my good buddy, Mr. Madman Mardik. You already know. You already know. If you don't know, now you know, Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. This is going to be fun. You know, and it's funny. As we, so we did this podcast because, you know, Jeff is a local man here. Uh, we met him uh, last year at Mohegan Sun. Yeah, so he had a pretty big booth there, and he's doing, you know, the truck thing and whatnot, and, it, you know, it's one of those things that's kind of overlooked as, as outdoorsmen and sportsmen, and, you know, we live and die by our truck, and, you know, it's one of the things that gets us somewhere, us being the outdoor drive, like, what drives you? Is your truck, and, and it gets you there, and some of the things and modifications that Jeff does is really cool. He's going to get into it in this podcast, but... You know, he is a an outdoorsman and a hunter also. So we'll we'll break in with him. Uh we gotta do a little bit of house cleaning. Was there any uh killer's corners? Uh I don't think so, but pro- Case and Carpenter probably killed something. So. <laughs> Case and Carpenter uh, did probably kill something. Or whatever you killed this week. Yeah. Uh I, I found some sheds. Does that work out for something? Yeah. I guess I got yeah. in the woods and did some oh, stuff, yeah. right? So um Oh bro, I didn't even tell you yet. I got in the woods finally too. I've been real busy at work. Yeah. But I found a I don't usually get too excited about, you know, a new spot or whatever, but I, I think I found something with some potential, man. And I got in there. Uh, shout out to our last two podcast guests, right? Like uh, Whitetail Partners and Ryan Glitzky, because they really got my wheels turning with the e-scouting and, and looking for some some overlooked spots. And, and I won't get into too many details, but <clears throat> I think I got into a spot, one of them, you know, classic overlooked spots, I guess you'd call it. And, uh, dude, zero sign of any other hunters, no old tree stands, no trail cameras. No, I don't think I knock on wood. I don't think anyone's hunting this area. And, uh, the sign was there. I didn't find any sheds, which would have been nice. To, That's you know, okay no, though. Yeah. But I mean, the sign is there and, and, uh, it's got some potential. I don't know if it's going to pan out, but I will have a camera in this area you know, this summer and, and it could pan out. So I'm pretty excited about that. So it's kind of funny is the area that I found those sheds is a, it is an overlooked area. It's one of those next to the truck spots, guys walk past it, trying to get somewhere into the meat and gravy. And I'll tell you what, it's, it's definitely what it is. And you know, it's funny as I've been in there twice already and I went in there once in the snow and I saw a ton of sign, right? And you see those prints. They're going to these oak trees. They're feeding in this area. And then the snow ends up melting, and you go in there. And then now it reveals all of the the scrapes and all mm-hmm. of the, you know, those those things that you're definitely looking forward and pinpointing on. And trails are really beaten down in the ground going to these spots. And uh, there were sheds in there. There was a bed. There was rubs, scrapes. You know, it was just that that telltale, like perfect area that guys are overlooking. And I'll be honest, man, it's literally a hundred feet off the beaten path as far as the walking trail that goes in. And it and it's one of those areas like you would think twice about going in there and hunting, but 
I think it's going to pan out. I'm at least like like you said. I'm going to have a camera in there. Get the intel. It's going to be an easy slip in spot because it's easy access on a certain wind. Um and it's a different wind than I would hunt in some of the other spots. Um I put 35 miles on boot in in that public land so far. Um trying to match up that set or make a set of that buck that I had missed last year. I have not found anything. I don't know. I have found no other antlers in there. I am not really sure what's up. Maybe they're just not on the ground, but I just cannot put the pieces of the puzzle to know where these things are wintering. And it's crazy because there's not that much sign. And 99.9% of the sign that I'm seeing is in little areas and right where I'm hunting. So Mm. pretty crazy. You know, the shed thing, though, I love sheds. I love finding sheds. I love finding the survivors, right, Right. knowing what you're working with for next year, you know. But they're they're really not that important, right? If the sign's there, especially, you you know, like we talked about in the last couple podcasts, if you find current sign from this past season thrown in with historical sign, you know, old rubs, you, you can pretty much bank on the fact that it's going to be a spot again this coming year. And um, that's all that really matters. It's the only problem is without finding those sheds, you know, you just got to wait a little bit longer to find out what you're actually working with come this season when, when the trail cameras start popping, say <clears throat> July, August, right? Mm-hmm. So it's and, and and as long as you're getting back into those spots, then those deer will still be there. Like you're understanding the lay of the land. The the antler right. aspect of it is, you know, it's not always in my opinion, it's not if you're finding a lot of antlers in an area, then that's their wintering area. That's right. not the area where they're gonna be when you're trying to hunt them. So like right. it's a good thing, right? Um it's it's tough. There's a fine line in it, right? Like some of those deer core areas might be pretty small, so you will find them. You know what I'm saying? So it's like yeah. sometimes they don't shed where you're hunting them, and sometimes right? they do. But just that's why that's why you hear deer. you hear a lot of stories of you know you shooting the big buck and your neighbors finding all of his sheds. Well, yeah, yeah. I'd I'd rather have the buck on my wall. You can keep all the sheds. Yeah, I got him. I got his last year of sheds. So what does it matter, right? I mean, that's that's how it goes. So, yeah. um, let's break into some sponsors, dude. Let's get Jeff on the line. I think uh, I think it's a fun one. We talk a little bit about Africa. Um, Africa has always been one of those areas that I really kind of think about a lot and kind of talk about and so on and so forth. I've never been there, but I've learned a ton about it and very interested with it. Some of the animals and creatures have always been, you know, uh, an eye, an eye catcher for me. So, um, my bucket list. what? It's on my bucket list. It's definitely a bucket list thing, but I don't know, I have this weird, weird feeling of, of Africa. So anyways, um, snakes? like snakes, <laughs> No, I don't like snakes, buddy. You already know I don't like snakes. So, uh, we are title sponsored by Huntworth. Huntworthgear.com. Guys, turkey season's right around the corner. Hands down. Some get those Durham pants, baby. You want you want to hunt right? Get the Durham. I mean, it's it's no questions asked. Hands down, the best turkey pants on the market. Um, knee pads, butt pads, all the things and above. Um, all of their stuff is super good. Their hoodie, their lightweight hoodie is the greatest. Um, it it, built in mass talk about running and gunning. I mean, it's, it just, it checks all the boxes when it comes to turkey hunting. get on over to Huntworth gear. I think there's still a sale 25 to 50% off of, uh, certain products. So huntworthgear.com, nourish the game calls, nourish the game calls dot com guys get them in close all of your turkey pot calls box calls little mother cluckers and mouth calls everybody likes a good old mouth call designed by myself um also um latitude latitude outdoors.com guys some really good stuff coming from them everything is back in stock they are having a last last minute no, sale. uh I forget what they're calling it. Yeah. It's so like that, a closeout. I think yeah. they're trying to move out some stock and, and get their 
so latitudeoutdoors.com go and check those guys out uh now's the time to get all that mobile hunting gear start thinking about next season mess around with it it's about to be nice outside springtime's coming you guys can climb up the trees mess around start to understand how to mobile hunt and get all of your gear build your climb now's the time latitudeoutdoors.com last but not least bow hunters united bow hunters united is, is the um advocates for bow hunters all the good things it's that time of year guys it's voting time um new new rules coming down the pipe new things happening bow hunters united become a member it is a free website bowhuntersunited.com so mardik let's get jeff on the phone do it up all right all right guys welcome back we are on the phone with Jeff Marzella. I did I mess that up? No, you're good. I think oh, you got it. All right, good. That's probably the first one out of 300 episodes that I didn't mess up. So we'll take it as a good one, man. How we doing, Jeff? Oh, doing great. Doing great. How about you guys? Another night, another podcast, my friend. As we we love and always can indulge in some great conversation. That's what we look forward to. We always look forward to that good stuff. So let's get right into it, man. Let's put it in four wheel drive as, as you know, I guess that's a little cliche, but um, why don't you tell everybody who you are, where you're from, and a little bit about what you do. Yeah. So name's Jeff Mazzella. Uh, I own a place called Northeast Truck and Off Road in Gales Ferry, Connecticut. We've been in business for about 15 years, uh, outfitting, upfitting trucks for lift kits, wheels, tires, uh, expedition t- style stuff. Uh, camping gear, truck caps, uh, all sorts of the fun stuff. Uh, we do nothing anybody actually needs, only the fun stuff. So anybody comes in the shop is happy to spend their money. It's not because they, uh, you know, need breaks or did something like that. So uh, it, it's done really well. Uh, been in Gales Ferry now for four and change years. And uh, yeah, doing great. Got a business partner, Jay, that, uh, you know, we've been hammering out, like I said, for 15 years and, Got a good crew in the back, good solid guys uh, that you know care about what they do, enjoy what they do, and uh, yeah, um, our biggest thing is like Patriots brand truck bed liners. Uh, tagline for that's America's bedliner. Uh, American made. The owners our age, you know, great guy down in uh, Louisiana, and uh, been with him for a long time, known him forever, and uh, yeah, I mean, outside of that, uh, grew up in North Stonington, you know, hunting, fishing. Uh, you know, woods, wood stuff, doing whatever, making fires, all causing havoc through uh, the woods of North Stonington, and and uh, just having always having a good time. All still good friends with everybody down there, and uh, yeah, we go on hunting expeditions and all sorts of other fun stuff uh, with all my uh, buddies from No Stuff. That's awesome, man. So what what made you want to get into the whole off road thing? I guess it's kind of good because everybody who comes in is real positive. They don't have a flat tire on the side of the road, and they need you yeah. to kind of fix their truck. So what what kind of made you want to get into that aspect of it? Because it's not something you really hear about. Yeah. So not that I fell into it, but uh, I started working for a Line X, uh, kind of a family friend, when I was like seventeen in high school, and then. Uh, you know, kept working after high school with him. Tried college for a hot second. That didn't work out for me. Um, but uh, all is good. And, you know, kept doing that. And 2008 hit. And my business partner now, we worked together there. Uh, 2008 hit. The guy uh, we worked for wanted to sell. And uh, I was living with my parents. And he had just got married. We didn't need to make much money. So we figured we'd go for it. And uh, started there. Kind of, I don't want to say fell into it because I love it. But uh Kind of, it wasn't like something I dreamt up. It just, right. uh, it all works out and I, I dream it all up now, you know? That's awesome. So, so it's a lot of like, I guess we, you know, for the hunting guys would be like more or less like hunting mods, guys that are like, like super outdoorsy and like doing things in their truck constantly, you know, like I would think when I think of it, right. I think of guys that are like bird hunters with dogs in the back, kind of like that kind of aspect of it. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, a lot of guys, a lot of guys do that stuff. Uh, that's what a lot of the truck cap guys are going, you know, the truck cap world you see a lot more younger guys now Mm -hmm. getting truck caps you know when we first started was always older guys uh retired going out on a trip out west and it's still like that but uh there's just a lot more you know families getting into it they want to go you know to the black hills and put a tent on the top of their 
recap and you know go mule deer hunting in, in montana and stuff like that and bringing their kids to you know you can camp where, wherever you want you know you can go on the top of a mountain wherever you know campers can't go and uh you know you get to see the sun and the you know horizon from completely different places so one of the things that you know, that kind of like kind of draw me to that type of world, I guess, would be that there's just so many modifications for guys that are like mobile hunter, you know, boots on the ground type hunting. Like when I think about it, you know, like I had a uh, Tacoma and I was going to do like the deck system and then put like kind of like a bed in the back of it and like just build that full, full blown, you know, mobile hunting thing. Because a lot of like our hunts, I would, you know, I'd drive to, to Maryland and sleep in my truck for a week, or I would go to Ohio and sleep in my truck for two weeks and all my gear and my hunting stuff. Like, is that the type of mods and stuff that you guys are doing in the truck shop? Yeah, absolutely. I got, uh, I got decked in my own truck and, you know, currently I don't use it for hunting too much. Uh, you know, I got a three-year-old and a five-year-old, so there's all those goodies in there. Whenever we're going on a trip, I got the 10 on top and I call it daddy decked. So, uh, <laughs> That's my thing there, but they, yeah, they make, you know, rifle holders and all sorts of different things you can attach to the inside of those things. And, uh, you know, they, they hold up really, really well. And, uh, I like that. I, I put that tent on top. It's a queen size bed. Kids love sleeping up there, you know, climbing the ladder and, and, uh, you know, having a good time outdoors. So and that's a lot of the big mods that people are doing is, especially since COVID man, you know, people are, will hitch up and go, they're working from home. So that means they can work from anywhere. And people are doing the sprinter vans, modding those out. And then, uh, you know, people who can, you know, I, I see guys that are working and hunting every day. You know, right. they're they're out working for Pfizer or something, but they're out in the middle of nowhere, just got a hot spot, and they're hunting every day and, you know, are kind of kind of working. And you're, so. that's, that's just so cool. Like, it, it honestly blows my mind, right? But to be able to, like, put the tents on top of the trucks and go places and do those things. Like, before, like – what what would be the equivalent of that is one of those like push in campers that you can put in the back of your truck like yeah, like yeah, yeah. which is i mean that puts a beating on a truck where i oh, mean how is cool but man it's a different you got you have no truck right at that point you literally your truck is now turned into a camper at that point yeah yeah and now one of the i guess one of the things or questions i have about those tents like you are they a pain in the butt to like take down? Like, so like every morning, like if we were to do say, I'll, 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 I'll lay out a scenario. So like, say that the three of us are about to go, we're going to go to Maryland, Eastern shore, and we're going to go down there and we're going to do some Turkey hunt. And we have, and we all have those tents. Like every morning we have to wake up, put those tents down before we go to take off. Like what is, what is the process kind of break down for you? It's super, super easy. I mean, it goes up just as fast as it comes down. It's, you know, you're taking the poles out of the, you know, out of the kind of, the, uh, you know, the curtains there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you're just folding it down. You pull it, you pull a rope, comes down, you latch it down, and you're good to go. You tuck it in so if it's raining, it doesn't, you know, get soaking wet in there. We're but, talking uh, minutes. Yeah, minutes, minutes. Yeah, yeah. okay. It's not like yeah, me freaking. trying to set up a tent at my buddy's house for a stag party. <laughs> like I'm out there for four hours trying to put this thing together, right? I mean, no, like no. it's a clam shell. You know, mine's a hard clam shell from Rough Country because they gave me a better deal than anybody. Uh, but you know, clam shells open, bed folds out, and it's ready to go. Clam shell like the old Volks Volkswagen tops. Is that like? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But there's nothing wrong. I mean, that's. And it and it's one hundred percent waterproof and all of that yeah. too. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. The mattress is already in it too. Yeah, there's a there's a thin mattress. You know, if if, uh, if if we if we go camping a bit more, I'll probably get a little thicker one. But it's a little thin, but uh, but I can sleep like a baby. So you know, it doesn't matter to me. So so what are some of the other mods that you would do for some of the outdoor type people that you know listeners or whatever that are kind of tuning in like like some of the things that they can kind of like, you know, look forward to seeing in your shop or some of the things that they could possibly do if they have their imaginations open. Yeah. So, I mean, outside of like the truck caps, you know, a lot of, a lot of hunters will get the covers if they don't, you know, if they decide against the cap, because once you have a cap, you, you know, you do only have a certain, you know, clearance of what you can put in the back of that truck now, unless you're taking it on and off. Um, a lot of guys are doing, you know, small lift kits and a little bit bigger tires just to, uh, just to get a little bit more ground clearance, you know, if you got to go off trail a little bit, 
you know, some of those dirt roads aren't really dirt roads, you know, so, you know, or, or you got to go grab a, you know, go grab a deer after you got, you know, you dragged it to some trail, it was old logging trail. And, you know, you want a little bit more ground clearance to go through that stuff, you know, without getting stuck in the middle of nowhere. So, you know, stuff like that. And, um, you know, power inverters, a bunch of different odd things that you don't think about. Like I got um, on my truck, again, for the kids, really. But when we go to the beach or around the woods or whatever, I have uh, um, a four gallon water tank that's off the back of my hitch that you pressurize and it's, you know, and it's a hose, you know, for four gallons. Mm -hmm. So you can utilize stuff like that. I got a, a Dometic, um, you know, water filtration system, you know, for when I, uh, you know, go out a little bit further and it'll filter the water, drinking water if you run out for longer trips. But yeah, all sorts of, you know, odd fun stuff, little trays that pull out coolers and uh, a bunch of things for the over, you know, if you think overlanding and hunting, it kind of goes hand in hand. Right. And, uh, you know, it looks good and, and uh, it's really, you know, really functional for, for all these guys. It's kind of crazy because some of those things like we would always make for our, like, you know, I used to have an, an old truck because we do a lot like in the northern woods of Maine and stuff like that. And you do like the big tubes, the, the big black tubes for showers on the side of them, yeah, you yeah. pressurize them and, and those just kind of like DIY things. But now they're starting to like really make those things and, and really yeah. outfit the trucks to do different things that they never did before. Yeah, I mean, some of these truck caps are coming with like, you know, the mold panels and, you know, you can attach axes. uh water tanks, power inverters, anything I just talked about and more to these, uh, you know, survival tools to, to all these mold panels inside your truck that don't take up any space because it's on the inside of the cap. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, they get really, really creative with this stuff and these engineers and, you know, the, it's, they're not only just engineers because like sometimes, you know, you get mad at the engineer because like, do they know what they're looking at? Do they know who's using this stuff? But on, on that end of the spectrum on the truck accessories, you know, these engineers are they're making it because they needed it. They're not, you know, they're not just, you know, your regular engineer that has to draw up something, but they're, they're using it in the field and, and they're, you know, hunters and outdoorsmen, like, you know, like the rest of us. Right. That's awesome. That's super cool though. Like guys want to do different things with their truck. I mean, like we live in our trucks, you know, we drive and, and now that, you know, with the new things of a lot of guys are starting to see that it's, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not hard to reach those goals of being able to go to other states and do different things like the it's 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 cost effective, you know, and a lot of guys are doing it in their trucks or traveling. So like those things are are very needed necessities to be able to do those things. So it's it's cool that somebody does it, you know, like it's not something you're DIYing at that point. Yeah, exactly. I mean, over these last couple of years, especially with COVID, a lot of small companies from these, you know, from they probably started out as DIY, you know, smart do you the uh I <laughs> smart DIY guys that uh you know got together and started making this stuff and they created some really big good companies, American made companies, uh, you know, through this whole thing and and really got it out to distributors and wholesalers and you know got it into our hands so we can, you know, give them to the customers. Now, Steve, you've been down to the shop. So, like, is there things down there that you think that maybe we should highlight as far as like things that, you know, to, to converse about as far as like the things in the shop and whatnot i don't know i mean dude the sky's the limit he's got he's got everything so um, most of the listeners you know that follow know that i had to get a new truck recently because the poor uh tacoma got totaled but um yeah so the first thing i did is i went and saw jeff i got first thing i needed was uh the patriot spraying bed liner like that first things first, you got to protect your truck, right? So I got that done. And then another thing that's huge to me that I think everybody should do, especially in the Northeast, is get your frame sprayed. Uh, Jeff, you're using Wolwax, right? Wolwax, yeah. It's an annual so, coating. That I'll let you do that. You know more about it than me. But basically, it, it go ahead with the salt and, and all that shit. Yeah, Wolwax is a lanolin-based product. So it's, you know, it's not, uh, you know, engine oil like the old days of, you know, chain chain bar oil that people are spraying in diesel fuel mix you know spraying on their truck like the old like our grandpas and uh um you know it's a good product it sticks on there good it, it gets into the crevices and uh you just do it every fall and you know you, you really don't ever have to worry about your truck rotting out you know like these do like i mean you saw with the Tacomas. i'm sure you you know you were wondering if you didn't get your frame replaced at some point already 
you know, they were all getting replaced, every single one of them. Yeah. Because of the Northeast, you know, this, this, uh, you know, salt that they're throwing on the road, the liquid stuff is just terrible, terrible to uh, all these vehicles that we're spending crazy money on. Yeah. Yeah. The so calcium my, chloride. My, my Tacoma did have the recall, so it had a brand new frame. But the first thing I did was get it sprayed, you know. Yeah. But um, but yeah. So after the, you know, the 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 protection, right, the bed liner and the framing. After that, I mean, we already touched on it as far as being like a mobile hunter or hunting out of your truck, right? Like the caps, the deck systems, and you know where that comes in huge to me is we all hunt out of our trucks, right? And like the biggest thing is storage and organization, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. You start hunting out of your truck for a couple of days, it turns into a shit show, right? You got shit yeah, every time. So, you know, especially you two can't. guys, you get two guys, two grown ass men in there trying to hunt out of the truck. I mean, forget it. Me and you, three days of turkey season, my truck is trashed. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, us going to Maine for turkey camp, you know, it's a, it's a lot of shit, you know. So, uh, I think that's where the deck system comes in huge and, and a cap. But, um, but yeah, like Jeff said, aside from that, you know, you either get, he's got the uh, lift kits or leveling kits you know, better, more off-road, your all-terrain tires. We didn't even touch on like auxiliary lights, you know, ditch lights yeah, and grill yeah, lights yeah. and all that stuff, which I'm a huge light guy, right? Because you know, as well as anybody you get, you get in a jam off-road, whether you're gutting a deer or field dressing a deer or whatever, there's a log in the road that you got to deal with. Like, it's nice to have some extra lights to, to light up the night. Um, yeah. I mean, like he said it best the first day I walked in the shop. We do all the fun shit, you know. Yeah. And I'm like, You're right. Everything in I want everything. Yeah. No, and that's and that stuff's important. And we I think it, one of the things is that we kind of overlook it, right? Like we're like, oh yeah, a truck. But like those things are superly overlooked as far as like spraying the frame. Like Steve talks about it a ton. Checking your, you know, checking your fluids, checking your air pressure, checking because the thing is we get, you know, we get so compassive with i get i don't even think it's the right word but what's that complacent, complacent. complacent. with um when it comes deer season when we're in the rut and the grind dude the last thing i'm thinking about is checking you know checking fluids and making sure things are good like we're getting up at 3 30 in the morning and we're coming home at dark and we're going to sleep and then we're doing it again repetitively time and time and time again and same with turkey season i mean and then and it's in the spring and you're and you're just running and going and going and going and going the last thing you think about is your truck so i think it's kind of one of those priorities that you kind of have to think about is that you know getting your truck all set up and and working you know i mean it's you probably see it the most honestly jeff where guys you know, want to get set up for that stuff or they get complacent. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people come in all the time just, and once you have it, you know, it's, it's one of those things like once you get, you know, a deck system, you'll probably never have a truck without one. You know, if you're an outdoors guy um, or, I mean, obviously the, you know, the construction worker too uses it, but, you know, to organize that stuff and, and, you know, just kind of keep your stuff in check and, you know, you can get a checklist and, where stuff goes and, and then you're not going to forget stuff. You're, you know, you're going to have a good time and you're not going to be stressed out about, you know, the mess in the back of your truck because, you know, you threw it all together because you were rushing home or, you know, before a trip or something like that. Right. Everything's got a home, you know, like yep. we're big on that with just our, our pack. So we take in the woods, like everything's got its spot and it goes into the pack in the same place in the same way every single day. And your truck can be the same way, right? Everything's got oh, a yeah. home. Everything goes in the same place. So, when you need it, you know where it is. But uh, I like what you said about the cap because, uh, all right, what does everyone call them now? Camper tops? I call it a cap. Yeah, cap. yeah camper but, tops. Uh, you're absolutely right, man. Growing up, it was such an old man thing. Yeah. And, I don't know. Even, are we old men now or, <laughs> or is it just cool? <laughs> you, might, you might have a point. You, you might, might have, have a point. point. But, uh, <laughs> but they, are, they are coming back, and you're seeing more yeah. and more of them, and they're not just old men. Um, even guys younger than us, but, um, I have, I want one so bad, but my thought on them is like, looks wise, I prefer no cap, you know, like yeah, aesthetically yeah, yeah. no caps way better, but the, the, the pros you gain from having that outweigh the looks, you know, like just have being able to put all your gear in the bed of the truck and being able to lock it up and no one can steal your, your tree stands or, or whatever you have in all your gear in the back. And it's, it's weatherproof. You don't have to worry about it getting rained on. Um, that's, I, I, uh, I ruined a video camera a couple years ago because I, it was in my backpack 
and it was in the bed of my truck and some rain came through that I wasn't expecting camera got wet and yeah. it's, it's not a camera anymore. So, um, well, it's still a camera. About- I just haven't gotten it fixed yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> can't see through the screen, but, um, yeah, just, just huge things like that, that I think, you know, if guys have the time and, and the ambition to do it, you can really, really set up a truck to be, you know, like an all the ultimate hunting rig, you know? Yeah. I mean, like, like you saw Steve, what's on my truck is, you know, they, they came out recently in America, but it's a South African, uh, company called smart cap. And I mean, that's, that one's built for the bush. So, you know, it's, it's made to move, it's made to dance, you know, around on the, in you know, off road and, uh, they have it set up. So for the outdoorsmen and, you know, they have little, uh, camping setups that can go on the side of it that, you know, have a grill on it and all that that pop right out of the side of it. They get really crazy with them. And, uh, you know, it's made for outdoors and for, you know, traveling and, you know, where no roads are. And that's what we need. I, like I said, and I can't say it enough is that it's not something that's talked about. We don't talk about it. Like guys, you know, like guys get it and they go and they do it, but like, it's not really talked about the things that they should. Like you probably get a lot of guys that come in firsthand and they're like, all right, what am I trying to do? You know what I'm saying? Like they yeah, just, that's my first question to guys, you know, and they're like, you know, I'm looking for a cap or a cover or, you know, I'm not sure. I'm like, well, what are you going to do? You know, right. what, you know, I can't answer that question without knowing, you know, is this just for groceries? Is this for, you know, are you going to shoot your groceries and you're in the middle of nowhere? Like you might want to cap, you know, you camping, like, what are you doing? And, you know, once people can get down to that question, because a lot of people don't, don't know the answer right away. They're like, I don't know. I just bought a truck, you know, right. and, you know, and, uh, you know, they're looking for my input, but it's such a subjective answer you know, from a wheel choice to a tire choice to, you know, to whether you need a cap or not, you know, I, I can't answer that, but I can ask questions so I can get you to your answer. Right. Which is super cool. Well, man, let's get down to the meat and gravy of this whole entire podcast. We want to know what <laughs> drives you, man, and, and what actually goes on because every, you know, we know what you do for, for work now and the business and the shop and this, that, and the other thing, but like, where did the outdoor world start for you for, you know, if, if we're going to send guys down to come down to your shop, they got to know that you're a true red, white, and blue, you know, yeah. outdoorsman. So uh, where, where did the outdoors start for you, Jeff? Uh, I mean, just early on growing up in North Stony with all my buddies, you know, I can, I can remember even as a kid, you know, we weren't pushed to stay inside at all. You know, it's a little bit different nowadays. And, uh, you know, we were out there, there was a pond in front of my buddy's house that, I mean, I swear when we were in second, third, fourth grade, like all we did every day was make the same dam over and over and over in this little river that that went to the, uh, you know, Pendleton Brook where we fished and, you know, we walk upstream and find little holes and, you know, do all that. And then, you know, in North Stone, you can kind of shoot guns wherever. So we learned how to shoot pretty early and, uh, you know, loved uh, emptying rounds. Yeah. And uh, you know, having fun with that. And, uh, you know, that became, you know, from outdoors to, you know, I raced motocross for years, uh, you know, probably when I started, maybe when I was like 14 or 15, um, until I was probably 25 or 26, something like that, until probably until I got married. Uh, and that ended that. But, you know, I got I to gotta keep my, my limbs together for, for her and the kids, I guess. So, um, but yeah, I mean, through and through always been around it and uh you know the, the hunting and uh you know the hunting license course when we were 13 when we were allowed to mm-hmm. and you know came from working at a goat farm to go there each night to you know to go get ready to shoot skeet and take these tests and do all that it was uh always a good time we were always out and about and doing all that stuff it was uh you know and then it, when you get older you know i know you guys make a lot of time for it uh but uh i don't make it nearly as much time as i should for it but uh you know now that i got my my son's three so i'm gonna start taking him you know through the woods a little bit more you know i, I had to explain to my daughter we had a picture of a zebra that uh we were all around and she saw some blood asked why it was hurt did we help it i said yeah we took it somewhere you know i couldn't really get to her yet but she's only five i didn't want to tell her that it uh that it died so uh you know, there's, there's all that, but, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun and, you know, my buddies go out, I, I kind of live semi vicariously through them a little bit in the hunting world. They go out to, 
uh, Alaska a couple times a year, go mule deer hunting out west and and pronghorn and all this other fun stuff. And they're, you know, they can spend weeks out there. They work their face off to do it, and uh, you know, they should enjoy it. And I got the kids, and you know, which, which I love. I wouldn't change that for the world. But uh, they can uh, they can have a blast. And I see their Instagram and, they, and our group text and all that, and you know bust each other's balls all the time about who missed what and uh you know it's always a good time even if i'm not there all the time you know so so you but you did get the time to you know go overseas and hunt in africa and all this other stuff which is i think it's something that a lot of people think about or or want to do but don't know how to make the first steps like what was it for you like i mean just flying in and like having to go there like what what was kind of like you know coming from here like what was what was going through your mind like what is going on and how is this how did this all pan out yeah, it was uh so how how we got to do it. We used to have these uh you know once a week dinners. Uh it was never beef, it was always some sort of bear or uh elk or whatever at my buddy's uh my buddy Josh's dad's house, Dave. And uh you know, he went every year since nineteen ninety eight and he's a wild, wild man. And uh you know, he just he got me to go in two thousand eleven, uh through uh saying you won't do it more than a few times. And uh <laughs> So I did it. And, uh, you know, so, uh, went there and, you know, uh, we went there for a lion hunt. I was going to be in reserve on a lion hunt. And, uh, uh, my buddy was also, uh, darting a rhino. This was at ham safaris over in South Africa. And, uh, it did that. It was a blast. I, I shot a spring buck there from, I don't know, maybe 200 yards. And, uh, you know, it did the blood on my face, the first kill in Africa, the whole thing. It was wicked cool. And, you know, people down there are great. There's, uh, you know, some places there like Johannesburg where you fly in. We had to stay there overnight. And uh, they said we weren't allowed outside. There's bars on the windows and everything. And so it's like a rough, rough city. But uh, it was a great time. And then from there, we went to uh, Namibia for a week or so, stayed in some tents and went hunting out there. It was great. So you had, that was all in one trip. You did the whole South Africa thing and then went to Nibia from there. Yeah. And, and Dave actually, he was there for like a month. He's always there for like a month. And, uh, so I, I went there, we stayed a week in South Africa. Then I was, uh, like a week and a half in Namibia and then I left and they stayed and went to a different part of Namibia. And, uh, Josh wasn't there at this point. He, he had left early because he was still racing. He was a pro, uh, 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 motocross racer for on four wheelers and he had to go to montreal to do some supercross race and uh so we were in namibia when he was there but yeah he dave kept staying and and uh it was uh it was a crazy time yeah we did a lot in one trip and each trip you know you want to go there for if you can you know a couple weeks and uh you know have a blast and enjoy the people and you know when you go there like people like us you know a lot of rich people go over there and that's why i think the you know kind of the stereotype of like going over to Africa and hunting is like, you know, all this money and this and that it's, it's awfully cheap in comparison to a guided hunt in America to go to Africa. And it's, it's worth it. It's different. Um, they, they treat you once they get to know you a little bit after a day or two and you're saying uh, you're busting their balls and you know, your, your buddies are going nuts, you know, yelling at you like we hate each other, except, you know, we all love each other. And, uh, you know, they get they get to know that we're just a bunch of rednecks that, uh, you know, can have a good time and, and go there and, and uh, just enjoy it. And, you know, it's not just a rich man's game over there. Yeah. And it, it's probably pretty crazy, though, like as far as like being there and, and and a lot of those people don't really speak that great of English, neither. Right. Like, so yeah, you're across yeah. you're across the seas in a different place and you're with a bunch of people and you're like, well, hold on if i'm in the bush with them and they really i don't really understand them and they don't really understand me like are they going to keep me safe i mean that's pro i mean does that one of those things that kind of like goes through your mind when you are there
Fishing like a local isn't just about catching fish. It's about connecting with the environment and the people who call it home. It's about hearing the stories and traditions that have been passed down for generations and sharing unforgettable moments with the people you meet along the way. Fishing like a local is having an experience that stays with you forever. And with Fishing Booker, you can experience it too, no matter where you are. Discover your next adventure on Fishing Booker. Yeah, I mean, kind of a little bit, like, especially when you're out, like, you know, you got to, some of these properties, you know, they're fenced in South Africa, but, you know, you're talking fence around 40,000 acres. Right. That, you know, you're not going to see the other side. It takes a long time to get there. And once you're driving and then you get out of the truck and start walking, what in one specific moment in time uh in 2011 we were we were uh lion hunting i was just an observer so i had nothing but the shooting sticks and you know we're walking around i'm like i'm not sure i'm ready for this i was like if we're hunting these things and you know they come out it's uh it's not going to be good for me if they're not ready and you know we come around this corner and there's there's a rhino staring at us and and the guide's like whoa 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 you know back up back up like stand still and, and I'm like, this thing's going to charge us. I mean, thankfully it didn't, but we just had to sneak around, you know, it, it was in the thick and, and there was a, there was a few times that, especially on that trip that I was like, I'm, I just have sticks. I can do nothing. And these are some strong animals and they don't stop running. And the thing there so, is like everything there seems to want to kill you, no matter as yeah, small yeah. as an ant or as big as a rhino, hippo, croc. I mean, like everything wants to kill you. Cause to yeah, survive. Namibia, you know, there's, they got the snakes and, you know, they said, you know, you know, watch out for the snakes. Just make sure, you know, if there's any holes in your tent, let us know. And, you know, there was duct tape over one of the holes and stuff. It was, you know, it was a little sketchy for me, but <laughs> it was a good time. So <laughs> They have black mambas, green mambas, vipers. Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of yeah. everything there. Like that's, ah, uh, that's, that's, yeah, it was wild. That is your tent. You man, it's not like you're staying in like a lodge or or you're you're actually in a soft wall tent. Yeah, in in Namibia we're in a soft wall tent. In in uh, in South Africa we were we were not. They're pretty good accommodations over there. But uh, uh, I'm sure there's good accommodations other places in Namibia. But yeah, we were in some soft wall tents uh, up on a hill, and you know that was it. I'm I'm super interested in this whole rhino darting thing because I you know and you said rhino darting and I, maybe a lot of people don't understand mm-hmm. but like killing a a rhino is a super expensive b I don't even think that you're allowed to do it anymore I think there is a I forgot what type of rhino but I think they you know you're allowed to kill them but I'm not sure they've changed a lot uh, in the past few years they they keep changing the laws about what you can bring back to America. Yeah. Right. And I think so, it's black, black rhinos and white rhinos, white rhinos. Yeah. Yeah. And, and right. you know, there was a, there was a, a certain amount the, you know, the countries in Africa could kill each year as management. And at one point it was one. Um, and, and so that makes it, you know, a $300,000 rhino mm-hmm. uh, and people do that, which is wild. But uh, but darting a rhino is it's 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 interesting. So, you know, you go there and uh, you're hunting these rhinos and you know trying to find a good one and trying to get up close to it. Getting up close to a rhino is not that easy. Um, and you know, it, there's a vet that uh, is on on the hunt with you as essentially one of the guides. And uh, once you dart it, uh, you got to wait for it to, you know, kind of slow down and lay down, and then you can get your pictures your measurements you know and all those measurements count i believe and uh you know to a certain point but uh um and then they they give it the juice to uh get back going and then that thing wakes up pissed just really shoot just shooting rhinos with covid19 backs <laughs> yeah <right. laughs> um i actually got the hold uh, uh i don't know if it was black or white uh rhino horn at my taxidermist because he's a big african game taxidermist it's definitely yeah. not a white rhino because they're right. a almost extinct and i don't think they allow you to I, even i always confuse the two so it must yeah. have been a black so anyway so he had it there he was getting ready to mount it so i was dropping off one of my deer and i held the horn 
and there was a saw mark in the horn because they take like some kind of sample and the horn was actually microchipped before it came into yeah, the country. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I was told that horn, just the horn was worth like $1.3 million on the black market. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's, they, that's where the poaching comes in play. Right. Mm-hmm. So they had microchipped it for, for, for theft really to make sure the thing didn't disappear and end up somewhere it shouldn't have been. Yeah. And I think, uh, I know all the, the elephant tusks and everything they have bar they have bar they're barcoded by the time they come here so i believe you know at, at that point if it's not at the person's house or where it's supposed to be then you can get into you know some problems mm. you know, if it's not there or you can't come up with it in a day you know you got a problem and uh you know which is good because you you know you need that um i don't necessarily understand you know what 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 people uh outside of the hunting community, I guess, uh, don't understand that, you know, the SCI, the SCIs of the world, the Dallas Safari Clubs of the world donate more money and have so much more to do with the conservation of these animals and hunting than, you know, the, 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 the WWF, uh, of the, the, you know, the, uh, worldwide federation of, uh, you know, whatever, uh, Wild I know they worldwide the name. W- <laughs> worldwide w- wildlife federation yeah yeah so you know scis and and uh you know the dallas safari clubs of the world donate way more money and have a lot more to do with conservation than than you know all those other uh save the elephant stuffs uh combined and you know w- we do that because of the you know the art of hunting the the love of hunting and the conservation we need these animals we need to protect them against the actual poachers and you know to keep these things going and you know having that you know pastime of hunting out there and and you know you want to keep them around so so you just hit the nail on the head when it comes to conservation right and you keep saying conservation i think i think in my opinion Africa is the the tip of the iceberg when it comes to conservation, right? Like they are the leading force of conservation when it comes to, you know, hunting and and taking care of, you know, certain things. And one of the things here, like America in itself is like trying to ban the big six, right? And yeah, you can't exactly, yeah. you can't import the big six. X, Y, and Z. But what they don't understand is, Jeff, if the three of us go over there and we're going to kill, you know, big game, right? And say, you know, some of these animals are $25,000 or, you know what I'm saying? A a lot of that money that goes over there is then trickled down. It's given to the government. The PHs are given X amount of dollars for you know taking the animal but the rest of it goes to the government and then it slowly trickles down through we'll call it the economy right and and all of the food from those animals is given to the tribesmen the people around for you know for food and then the money's used for schooling and all of this and clothes for the kids and it's a lot for us Americans or they call them the white guys when they come over there to hunt, mm-hmm. like that's what drives their, their, yeah, you know, the economics a huge, huge part of the economy. I mean, you know, a- anything that gets shot, uh, you know, in South Africa, you know, it depends on where you are, but you know, it's going to go to the butcher shop the next day. You know what you don't eat that night, you know, each kill, you know, you get something that night typically, and uh you know they'll, they'll stir it up for you but uh everything gets cut up and used and you know all that money the phs actually don't get paid much at all which is wild we can get that we got that out of them this time and it's like how do you even and they have to pay for their own gas for you know their land cruisers and all that they're their own vehicles getting beat up they don't get paid much of anything and uh so the tip's important but uh you know everything is used and you know i think there there needs to maybe be a little bit you know, there's some, just like our, our government and any any government, really, there's some fishy stuff going on. But as long as they can keep these poachers at bay, you know, they have a shoot to kill policy. You know, if if they find somebody trying to poach an elephant, you know, they're they're killing that person. And and that doesn't even stop them. So, you know, you need more money involved and, you know, you got to, you know, keep this stuff going because, you know, those poachers eventually that's what that's what it thinks these animals is is poaching and you know uh the rhino horns is all it is is you know it's the same material as your fingernail just in a massive quantity 
and that's you know it's supposed to be an aphrodisiac in Asia or something like that, but uh, you know that's where a lot of that stuff goes, and and uh, you know SCI's like I said SCI, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, you know Dallas Safari Club, all those guys, you know they they put the money you know to the lobbyists and where it needs to go here to the con conservation of all those animals. Yeah, and I think one of the things is a lot of the anti, you know, they get it from all over, and it's not there's no there's no you know there's no antis in Africa. They're anti poachers. You know, everything yeah, exactly. there is to get, you know, they're not against hunting there because it brings so much. It's the other countries that go there. Not only do Americans go there, but people from Europe go there. People from, mm -hmm. you know, all over the country go there to hunt. So it's not, you know, the, the Russians, the European. Yeah, like Russians all those and guys. Americans are the top two. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then Europe, you know, Europe as a, as a, as an area, I guess would is, is a, is a close third, but Russians and Americans are, are the top dogs over there. Are huge. But. And and that's what, you know, thrives <laughs> those areas. And, like, guys don't understand it, which is is a lot of the things in with a lot of the animals. Like, not so much South Africa, like you had said, but, like, the thing with South Africa, a lot of that is that high fence stuff. But when you start to get to, like, that Namibia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and all that stuff where it's, like, super bush. But, like, if you could think about it, right? And I've, I've talked about this on other podcasts with, you know, the center being – you know, Africa as a whole, like the tribes, right? And then you start to go out. The next ring out is the hunters. Then the next is the safari, right? And mm -hmm. the animals that they actually kill are are the 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 mature ones. Like you want to talk about conservationists and and taking trophy animals. The reason they do that is a maturity level. Like when those they get kicked out of those prides and all that stuff. Like as far as like the lions and stuff like that, they're killing the very mature animals that are not, you know, they're past their, their sexual maturity to, to pass on. They're taking the big mature animals and those are their trophy animals. You know, they're not killing their very strong pride animals. Um, they're taking a lot of their bigger animals out of their herds. Um, to to you know as as conservationist you know like and and you know especially in the in the zimbabwe's and mozambiques <clears throat> i haven't hunted there but uh you know my my buddies have and you know eventually i'd love to but uh you know there's no fence it's it's wild wild africa and uh you know if, if an elephant gets shot or any any large animal whatsoever i mean it's it's wild because they said that like there's there's nothing around where where you're shooting these things and within an hour You'll have a hundred tribes, you know, tribes people over there. Everyone's cutting it up. They're taking it home, you know, to their villages and everything. And everything is getting used. Mm -hmm. And like you said, for for an animal that's past its prime and you know brings in money and conservation to the rest of you know Africa and the and the state and the uh, countries there, you know, that's what's going on there. It's not it's not, you know, what they talk about. And you know, everyone puts us like like where are the poachers and how how could we possibly do that right and and i don't know i watched lion king with my with my kids the other day and and i think that that's where it started i don't know but. it really is disney is probably <laughs> the devil i mean like yeah. let's be honest disney is the devil they a lot of their stuff is anti anti hunting anti you know like i mean they're brainwashing people at, at right at the start um you you want to watch something really cool uh, I don't know if you've watched it yet or not, but there's a there's a series or not a series, but like a documentary that was done. Um, it's called Trophy. Um, if you haven't watched it, it's it's something to sit down and watch, and especially you being there and understanding it. And for listeners, so you want to really understand, you know, the grit, the grind that that turns the wheels in Africa. Like Trophy is it? Like that's. They what it was was it was an anti an anti hunting organization that wanted to write a documentation on hunting and and you know trophy hunting and how bad it is and so on and so forth and they really got their eyes opened. Um, of yeah, they figured out it was actually the opposite. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. They were trying to like shoot down on it and to really <laughs> realize that that's not the case. Um, that it, it really is the forefront of, you know, the revolving, you know, the turning wheels of, of that country and how important it actually is. And I think that we have, you know, here in America, we have some types of, you know, 
some types of conservation, but not to the forefront that they do. Like Africa is huge. Like it's big on how how much conservation they actually use and how effective they are with with doing that. You know, um, mm-hmm. it's wild. It's I couldn't. I just can't believe how good they are at it. You know. Yeah, they do really, really well. I mean, and you know, when in South Africa, like you know, it's a like I said, it's a fenced area, so each hunting place is owned by somebody, um, and you know, it's a business to them, and and it's you know conservation. Some of that money, they don't keep all the money you give them, mm-hmm. and you know that has to go to certain levels of government that are in charge of all that stuff. And you know, I think it works out good. And you know, like I said, I, I think that. You know, the, uh, the the U.S., how they kind of keep saying that you, you can't bring a lion or you can't bring uh, an elephant or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, you know, I think they're 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 listening to the loudest, the loudest voice at the moment. And like I think we always do. And, uh, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the gets the grease. And and, uh, you know, I think it's a bad way to bad way to do business because it, it really takes away from from Africa as a whole in the hunting community in general so jeff when you were there what were some of the other animals that you've taken did you take a cape yeah so in april uh we went and uh took a cape buffalo took a took a, a nice cape buffalo and that was a that was kind of a wild hunt because uh they didn't know we were there there was a there was a good herd of maybe 50 of them and they got the whole herd was at one point before uh you know, before the shooting happened, um, you know, they were about 30 yards from me and they were, they, how, how they were tracking was, it looked like they were going to be about 10 yards from me, which even with a three, seven, five H and H was, uh, was my heart was going wild. And, you know, and then all of a sudden they smelt us, they all looked up, turned. And cause I had, I, we were going after like the fourth one in the line, I guess. And, uh, so they, they had to walk past me until they, until they smelt us and they went about 50 yards the other way. And then I could, I could get a clean shot at that point. And, but I, I had to shoot it probably three times. Those things can take some heat. Those, uh, really all African animals are, are, they just, uh, are brute and, and big and they can take, uh, they can take the pain and, and keep going. But what, what kind of was going through your mind? I mean, like you're talking like you, you are not the top of the food chain at that point. Like you <laughs> are, you are a bumblebee compared to what is going on in, in, I, I, I have this huge attraction to them for some reason. I don't know what it is, but Cape Buffalo's like they're big bosses on their heads. Like it's just, yeah. I, I, I'm amazed by them. Right. And it's, yeah, that's what, that's what got me. I told, uh, I told a guy at SCI that, uh, back in 2010 or 11 it must have been 11 when i went because it was after the first time we went but uh, uh i had said i was like ah, in five years i want to shoot a cape buffalo like that's my that's my animal that's what i want to get and some more time went by than that but you know i ended up getting one and it's beautiful animal it's such a huge huge powerful you know bull it was insane and uh what was going through my head a little bit we heard a story from one of my buddies who they went there before me, you know, a couple of weeks before me. And uh, in the airport, they ran into a guy that was all jacked up. You know, he was beat up in his face and, you know, and he was coming back with the, uh, you know, with, with another hunting group. And was, and he, they asked him like, you know, what's going on with you? What happened? And he was Cape Buffalo hunting, uh, missed. And the Buffalo came after him and uh you know hooked his horn on the guy's belt loop and threw him about 40 feet and and i'm thinking oh man we're going to do this i hope that doesn't happen (laughs) (laughs) yeah a wild story the guy was lucky you know anything more didn't happen he could have gotten gouged you know gored or anything but and 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 like like in in a in relevant like how how big is that animal like walking up to the like there's no ground shrinkage there's no like this thing is just yeah. absolute beast yeah it is it is like the uh take a a fast version of the biggest ox you've ever seen at a fair pulling the biggest amount of weight you know i don't know how to explain it but it's just a massive you know, freight train you know run through wow. did you, you end up care br- what's in front of them you know they're running over you know 
trees way bigger than saplings. You know, if they're if they're on the go, they're going. Did you end up mounting it and bringing it home, or? Uh, so it takes a while to stuff get stuff back from Africa, and um, so it had to go, you know, to the tax taxidermist over there. Any, you know, any war hogs or anything that anybody shot uh, had to get gassed and everything over there. They, they don't allow them to get gassed over here anymore um, because of the bugs and whatever. But uh, uh, we haven't gotten any, anything back yet. We probably will see it in the next month or so. Um, but yeah, it's going to get uh, shipped over to um, Queen, uh, not Queens, but uh, somewhere in New York City that we picked them up before. And then they, they come back to Davy's house and throw them together for us. That's awesome. Yeah, because you got to like crate them over and this, that, and the other thing. Like it's it's a big process to get them back. It's even more now. It's a, it's a bit more expensive to get them over now because they make every person have their own crate, and they used to be able to put it in. You in a can't big, share big crates. No, nope. and uh, for whatever reason, but that's the uh, you know the the fish and wildlife. You know, uh, I don't know if it's wanting their cut or. It's a government uh, it's thing. A, that's a money, yeah, money grabbing yeah, thing right thing. there. Yeah, because you know, all of a sudden, from you know, from maybe a thousand bucks a person, it, you know, was ten years ago to share a huge crate, and everyone got the same amount of animals. You know, some bigger animals, obviously, this time, a couple, couple of buffaloes, but uh, you know, now it's three thousand dollars per crate <laughs> per guy, and you know, that ends up they got their money. Is that on the export side or the import side? They won't let you share it uh coming back here so importing it yeah but is it u.s not letting you share or is it africa shipping it out uh it's i believe it's the u.s not letting you share not they want to know exactly where everything is going in the address yeah. yeah well now with the big push of of the uh importation of the big six like yeah. they yeah. they've put a they've you know there's a lot of a lot of change where the U.S. is trying to step in on the importation because they think if you know if you're stopping the importation of these animals, then then they'll be able to have some effect on people going over there and then coming back back here. And one of the things that a lot of people don't understand too is I know that this is not a very you know I'm gonna get I'm gonna get in trouble for saying this, but uh, you can go to Africa or South Africa for very cheap and not bring home the trophy or not kill trophy animals. So like you can go over there and where a lot of your costs like elevate is going and killing animals and importing them because you have to pay the government a certain amount of money. And then you have to pay the U S government a certain amount of money for import. So like, a lot of PHs will do this where you can set up a hunt with them, hunt these animals, take pictures, but you don't have any physical trophy to bring back home. So now you're cutting out a lot of the cost. So you can kill a pile of yeah, animals and then kill. Yeah. You, know, you can go coal hunting, coal hunting like crazy over there. And, and you can do that while you, you know, if I had a couple extra days and, you know, we we're bored, you can, you can go coal hunting because, mm -hmm. you know, they got to, they got to get the genes right. This is, you know, in South Africa, it's private property. It's it's a little bit different, but right. um, yeah, you can you can go shoot a kudu with one horn. You know, you can go shoot a kudu with a, with a horn going out this way. We saw one like that. You know, and uh, for some reason they wanted money for that one, but uh, a bunch of money for that one. But uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, you can go coal hunting and yeah, have a have a good time and and not bring anything back. And you know, really like if you get the chance to go with anybody. Um, whether uh if they're hunting or you're hunting it's it's typically like 150 bucks a day for an observer and then like there is a list you could shoot one if you wanted to but you don't have to buy a package but it's 150 bucks and that's like uh lodging food uh alcohol the whole the whole thing three meals a day and uh, all the alcohol you can drink if you want to but I, I think another thing a lot of people overlook too is, you know, you, you think of Africa and you think of the, you know, the, the big six, the dangerous game and all that stuff, right? Like the sexy stuff, the lions, the hippos, the rhinos and all that stuff. But there's so many plains animals that are overlooked that are, are a lot more on the cheaper side. Right. And you could go oh, like yeah. six day hunt and kill what? Six, six different species of plains. Yeah, I, mean, like, uh, I saw one recently from the Dallas Safari Club that my buddies went to uh, that it was, I think it was eight or nine animals and, you know, seven or eight day hunt 
you know, and all your lodging and everything. And it was like five grand. Right. I mean, and, and a kudu, like if a kudu is on a list, a kudu is the most, one of the most beautiful animals I've seen. You know, they're, you know, their hides gorgeous. They're, you know, the, the deep curls in their horns are just, are wild. And, uh, you know, same thing like Gemsbuck and Eland and, you know, you can get some pretty big animals for, uh, they you will. know, in package. That, that's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a question I've been dying to ask just to kind of tie this all together. <clears throat> I saw some of the pictures with you with the, uh, with the land cruisers out there. So <clears throat> aside from, you know, rely the reliability of a Toyota in the bush. Is there mm -hmm. any, is there any particular like accessories or, or aspects of the Land Cruisers that you see that are like super important in the bush over there that you can kind of, you know, cross reference to, you know, what we were talking about earlier with guys hunting here. Like, is it, you know, a good set of tires or is it brush guards or snorkels or like, was there something that you see in, in the vehicles that they use in the bush over there? Yeah, I mean, there the snorkels definitely came in handy. One guy didn't have good tires, and we got stuck pretty good. Um, but uh, tires and those brush I mean, you wouldn't believe. I mean, the prickers, you know, are, are as long as your your index finger over there, and you know they're running over them. You know, they got the Kevlar good year, uh, good years, yeah, and uh, you know they're tracking through everything, and the, you know huge rocks they're going over. We're going into places that really don't are not made for a vehicle, and those Land Cruisers. I mean, what what we should have over here is is those Land Cruisers with a nice little diesel motor, you know, standard, real low gear. You can get through anything, and uh, yeah, it's it's really tough to get them stuck. I've seen it happen, but but those things go over crazy, you know, crazy terrain. And uh, I did talk to a guy out there, one of the uh, PHs. Um, his parents own, I guess, some Toyota dealerships over there somewhere, and. Uh, I said, we need to get him 25 years or older. And I said, I'll buy as many as you want to, to send me because it, it would kill over here. It would just, they would, you see those mini trucks driving around, the Toyota Land Cruisers would take it over. I was just thinking the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> I think the crazy if Toyota made a mini truck. Now we're talking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And the thing is, uh, one of the craziest things that I found about that is that they don't even have like radios in them. Some of them do. Some, you know, there there was a even the brand new ones. The Land Cruiser, like the owner of the whole property, had one, and that thing was set up. It was like a, uh, you know, Toyota Land Cruiser Lariat Ford or something. You know, it, yeah. it had everything. Toyota. But, but yeah, some of these things are are bare bones, and and they they should make them bare bones so you know people can afford them. But, yeah. Uh, the the other, I thought they had like a USB thing in them, and then they that's how they listen to music and stuff like that. Like they would upload them onto like hard drives. I mean, I think some of the some of the guys still have MP3s, you know. Okay. But uh, but yeah, some of them, some of them are set up, some of them are still pretty old. But they those things are ruthless. They just live in the old days. Like it's still they're so behind on a lot of the things that go on over there, in my opinion, right? Like it's yeah, well, they're going, you know, not for nothing, but they're almost going backwards. I mean, they have their power grid is so bad. They had rolling blackouts the whole time we were there. Mm -hmm. Every four hours for two hours, you know, or something like that we there's no power right you know, there's even when you're sleeping you know or, or you're having dinner if you have dinner too late you know the power is going out mid-dinner and uh you know if you're driving to a different property or something like that you see that the, you know there's no one's taking care of the power lines and uh you know it's a it's kind of a mess compared to where where it was in 2011 and 12 it's uh south africa is has been going downhill i, I guess as a society uh you know, from, from the last 10 years for mm. sure. That's crazy. Well, Jeff, I got one last question for, for you, man, before we end this good old podcast. And that is what drives you outdoors? Uh, what drives me outdoors? I mean, now that I'm a dad, I mean, the, you know, the kids, you know, enjoying, they, they always want to go in the woods. We we'll drive by some trees and they want to go in the woods. You know, we could be on the highway. They want to go in the woods. And, uh, you know, I want to make sure that they, stay doing that you know i don't i don't want uh you know the the COVID kids to uh to be indoors and playing video games and all that i want them to be outside and you know just being outside that you know if you're going through something you can get to the top of the mountain by yourself and just scream your face off just to get it out to uh to just enjoying you know the sunrise off, off a mountain it's it's uh outdoors is is just incredible and and uh, i think it's uh super underrated 
That's awesome. I mean, I, I guess, Jeff, you would be the only one that could say what <laughs> what drives you outdoors would be a pickup truck. I think uh, that we could accept oh, yeah, that. I guess, but... I guess I could have said that. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably the only one because normally I'll ask what drives you outdoors, and then we'll go, not your hunting truck. We want to know what really <laughs> drives you, what takes your gears, yeah. man. So I think it's awesome. Yeah. Um, Jeff, one last thing. Uh, I know that um, – People kind of going to want to find out like where you're from, what you got going on, so on and so forth. Can you give them, uh, and I'll link it below also, but uh, a website to go and check you out and a social media platform or handle that they can go and check you out also to kind of see what you got going on. Yeah, so uh, Instagram, uh, we're always posting stuff on there. Uh, Instagram and TikTok is uh, at NE Truck and Off Road. Um, Websites, NE Truck and Off Road.com. Uh, it's, it's a informational site where you can get a hold of us there, you know, but stop by We're we're about a mile and a half from the sub base and Gales Ferry. And, uh, you know, always, always open Monday through Friday, eight to five. And a lot of Saturdays I'm there, whether I open the door or not, depends on how I'm feeling, but, um, you know, always busy over there and, uh, and, you know, always love talking to people. I, you know, talking to people is, uh, is one of those things that once I get a story out of somebody, I'll remember them forever. And, uh, you know, I always recognize them and ask them about, you know, something that happened three years ago that they told me. And uh, that's the only way I get to uh, really remember people is through their stories. Awesome. It's man. kind of funny because that's how that po- this podcast came to fruition because I dropped my truck off and I didn't even really know you were a big outdoorsman, right? And Africa came up and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get together, bud. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, it's awesome. a big time. Well, Jeff, we really appreciate you jumping on, man. Everybody go and check him out. If you need some truck updates or whatever, go and check out his website, whatever. Um, Might tickle your fancy when it comes to that. I think it sounds like he's kind of got everything. But for everybody else, thanks for taking the ride right here on the app.